Let us pray. God of mercies and truth, of power and might, of wisdom and love, be with us now as we open your word, as we hear your words once more, as we now come together to seek for your truth and for your guidance and your comfort. Let your presence be felt this day. Let your truth be known. And indeed, we will be charged to walk after you and with you. We thank you, God. Be with us. And this we pray in your name. Amen. Just a quick plug for the uh, uh, sermon series. There's a new sermon series starting today, and then we'll go through the month of August. Um, and then we will start a brand new whole f- set of sermon series starting in the fall. So that when you go down outside, you will see posters for this upcoming sermon series. But you will also see all the sermon series that will be coming for the entire fall uh, starting in September. Where we're going to look at the uh, book of James. In October, we're going to look at the book of Job. And, uh, and also in uh, November, we'll, also, we'll look at the book of Hebrews. Uh, as we explore the, the passions of God. And when we come December, it will be time for Advent. So now that you know what's going to be coming, you know what's ahead, you can prepare as well and share that news and anyone who might like to hear the messages from those passages to come and join us for Sunday worship as we gather here at New Hope Church. So in light of the tragic shooting in Aurora, Colorado over a week ago now, many are sharing online and asking questions to such that how can evil exist in the presence of all powerful, all good and loving God? Perhaps you were asking that question, and we actually had a sermon series on this some time ago discussing this matter. Um, but if some of you may be asking that question, or some, you may know someone asking that question. You may be wondering that, about that question. So I thought maybe it would be really appropriate for us to come together and worship today to think about that as we began this series of sermons, to talk about where is really God is presence in our lives. The series is called Emmanuel, God with us. Is God really with us in all aspects of life when we go through the, the height of experiences and the valleys and the darkness of things and the troubles that we encounter? Is God's presence really real in our lives as we seek to know God and how do we know God is there with us? And what's into this major tragedy that took place that our focus and our attention is focused, focused now on all the victims and all the survivors and also on the shooter the attention shift to all these legal as well as political issues and conversations. But for today, I really want to ask the theological questions. Where was God when tragedy struck? Where was God when there is something that terrible you can imagine that happened? Where was God in Aurora, Colorado at that moment at 12.05 a.m. Friday morning? Where was God? And on CNN, you can actually see that the investigators, I was trying to be lazy, but it's not going to work. This is a little too high for me, a little too short. I need one that's about six inches shorter. You know, so Elder Mickey, could you kind of... It doesn't work. That's okay. I'll just stand. Um, I'm making my, uh, my, my team work a lot more. So if you, anyone want to help him, that's fine too. Just kidding. It's okay, Chang Su. Um, I lost my place here for a second, trying to be funny. As I was talking to one of my friends, asking the question, the theological question, where was God? And on CNN, you actually can see that the investigators had drafted a computer simulation where shots were fired. And you can actually see the seedings and where people were leaving based on story accounts. And it's unimaginable in my mind. So how my, our question today is asking that theological questions. That spiritual question, where was God in Aurora that night? And where was God in your life when things are not going the way you have hope and plans and desire? And where was God when there is death, tragedies and loss and devastations? One of my friends online, I was talking to a colleague as we were just discussing this. It's like I, we can't imagine there's another shooting in Colorado. The response was, wasn't, wasn't a Columbine enough? Some of you may not be old enough to remember Columbine, but Columbine was one of the major high school shootings uh, just 20 years ago when a high school student opened fire, two students opened fire in the hallway of the high school and killing many in that school. 
But instead of just focusing on that event in Aurora, I want to kind of lift us up to ask the bigger questions. What does it mean when God, when there's tremendous tragedy that struck unexpected? And in light of that, let's also look at the events of human histories and larger events of tragedy that have taken place around. So in this sermon today, I'd like to draw two stories, one from Dr. King's sermons on the eulogy for a four girl who was killed in the church bombing in Alabama, as well as Ellie Wiesel's writing the book called The Night. How many of you guys read The Night? Raise your hand if you read the book Night. Really? I don't see many hands. Many of you guys haven't read the book. You know what the book is about, by the way? Anybody? The book Night is written by Ellie Wiesel as a Holocaust survivor. As a young person, he, he endured the entire Holocaust in concentration camp under Nazi Germany, and he wrote about God, his experiences, that in the darkness of night, the brightness of day comes in the faith of God. And we'll talk about that in a bit. But I want to tell you first about the story that happens in Birmingham, Alabama. It's September 15, 1963. It was a time when racially motivated terrorism was around all the time. Four girls were murdered at the church on that Sunday. In the end, in the 1960s, there's a civil rights movement. That event of that bombing would be the pivotal moment that propelled the Civil Rights Act of 1964 to pass because this event happened the year before. And prior to that movement, the 16th Street Baptist Church was the, in a way the unofficial headquarter for many civil rights movement conversations. Dr. King, Ralph, um, David Abernathy, and many other leaders met together with all these southern coalitions of Christian leaders. Civil rights movement was a Christian movement to bring the goodness of God in light of the difficulty of racially charged world. They discussed all these matters at that church. But early Sunday morning, four members of United Clans of America, the Ku Klux Klan, that's part of that in Alabama, planted a box of dynamite at the lower part of the step to entrance to the church. At, 22, at 10.22 a.m., 26 children were walking up those steps, going to church, as every Sunday they do. And of all the sermons, that title of the sermon that day is called, was called The Love That Forgives. The irony of that sermon, the love that forgets. At, at 10.22 a.m., the bomb went off and instantly killed four girls aged from 14 to 11 and injured 22 other children and adults in that explosion. The explosion will blow a hole in the church rear walls, destroy entire back steps, and once, but all but one stained glass window. This is one of the biggest... Baptist Church in Alabama. So it's covered all the way around with stained glass window. That explosion would, would destroy all but one. And the window was the picture of Jesus leading a group of children. The irony of that event. So where was God in that blatant, racially charged terrorism that happened in our country against children, no less? And precisely this question, where was God in, when there is evil in the world, is a, question, it's a doctrine called theodicies. If you don't know that doctrine, just say it with me, theodicies. Okay? I, want, I don't want to lose you here, and I know some, some of you have talked to me that maybe I go a little too deep in my theological teachings, but just stay here a little bit. If you see anybody's eyes start to glaze over, just pinch them. And, uh, and wives, if you see a husband start dozing off, just elbow them. Okay? So make sure they're awake. Theology is basically the doctrine, theological doctrine, asking the questions of the presence and reality of evil in light of the all-powering, powerful, and loving God. How can evil exist when we believe that God, all-loving, all-powerful, exists? So evil becomes the opposing force of the goodness of God, and that's the doctrine of theology. And that's in a, in a just, just a simple way to put it. What I'm asking you is that evil exists. There's no question about that. And our faith, believing God, in no way is movable or changeable or questions in that such a way that we may damage our faith when there's evil. And let me tell you why. If evil indeed has a grasp and hold on our world, 
there will be no goodness. There will be no love. There will be no joy. There will be no anything opposing the goodness, I mean, power of evil in the world. The reason faith exists is not just a blind faith, but because God exists in opposing against the evil of the world. God exists through us who believe and hold to walk that path of goodness. God exists to work through us to propel the message of Christ to change and transform the world. And God's goodness permeates, penetrates, spreads, and overruns against evil. Why is this evil then is the next question we will ask. Evil exists because God's all-powerful love to buy, give us a choice to choose. Of all the creatures God created in this world, we're the only one who has the ability to not only recognize God, and all, but also to love and obey God. But also, God gives us a choice to reject God. And in that rejection, which all, some humans do choose to do, will choose the opposite of good. Instead of love, there will be hatred. And so light, they choose the path of darkness. So evil exists not because God wills it exist, but God lets it exist by God's love for humanity to choose what's right and what's wrong. Okay? We all got to understand that? I want to make sure no glassy eyes, no one's lost. So the question here is asked is, where was God in light of that blatant evil? Where was God in Aurora that night? Where was God when there is trouble in our lives? Where was God when you sit there and watch a loved one wither away by chemotherapy, by a disease you cannot cure, by a situation you cannot control? Where was God in that situation? Again, going back to CNN, one of the blogs I like to read from CNN is called Belief Blog. And the author is a theologian. He raises seven possible seven responses people have been sending to him in the last week or so. And I'm just going to go through that very quickly because this is not the main point of the sermon. But it's interesting enough to consider, for us to think about in our hearts. The seven common responses are, number one, there's no God. Two percent of Americans today are, 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 are practicing atheists. So if there's no God, this question, where was God, becomes moot. We don't need to ask that question. God wasn't involved. Number two is don't blame God, but blame Satan. Satan made me do it. We all, can, we all understand that. It's not my fault, but Satan made me do it. Right? Number three is don't blame God, but blame us. This is the most common Christian response. The response here is that God gives us a free will, as I explained and then share with you. In fact, the victim, the vic, there's a victim openly forgive one of the, the one, forgive the shooter in a video that we probably, some of you have seen already by, by now. That the act of God, the violence of this event, was not God's will, but, but people doing bad things. This person was mentally ill, or this person was depressed from the graduate degree that he could not pursue. Whatever reason it was, we don't know for clearly for sure. But don't blame God, but blame us. Number four is that God was behind the massacre, and was just, it was just. There's, a group of, there's a Christ, also a, another Christian response is that this dramatic proclamation that some believe that God is behind this massacre as a wake-up call to an America that deny and that also ignore God and reject God. So the massacre was completely in God's control for it to happen. So therefore, it acts as a wake-up call for us who continue to reject God in every way we can think of as a nation. And the famous evangelical um, uh, Pers- uh, pastor explained 9 11 happened as because the nation has gone astray. Number five is that one of the classical teachings is that God was present at the massacre but with the victims and not the perpetrators. One of the classical teachings of Abrahamic traditions that connect all of us together Judaism, Christians, and Muslim throughout the scripture and Old Testament, God is the one who, with those who suffer the oppressed, the poor, those who have been oppressed by others. So, this is a way that God's being present. Where was God? God was there at, in the victim's life when they were being shot, when they were crawling away for safety, when they were being wounded, when they were facing the shooters in the eyes. Number six is that, which God? 
This is a common notion that God simply saying, well, there's so many gods out there. It's a pantheon of gods. If you believe in God's war, well, course, there's of course warfare. If you believe that God is evil, there's evil in the world. So this is, this is a kind of a pluralistic perspective of multidimensional God that so many gods out there so you can believe whatever God you want to believe. And number seven is that who knows? It's a complete mystery. We as human beings do not grasp the minds and the will of God. How do we understand that we can't? It's completely beyond our comprehension. So this comes to us now to this part of the sermon in Psalm 14. Psalm 14 declares to us, Fool says in their heart, there is no God. Psalm 14 comes to us in the context talking about and speaking the word of God in the way that talks about God as a force that people have now rejected in that time. And he, uh, the psalmist tells us that in this case, not only do people say there's no God, in fact, there's no good deeds. In fact, there's no one doing good things. And the rejection of God comes in such a way that they can't find God. And in verse 2 is a key of this verse. It, say, it tells us, The Lord looked down from heaven to humankind to see if there are any who are wise, who seek after God. The contrast here in Psalm is saying, The fool declared there's no God, but the wise are the ones who are seeking after God. The fool are the ones who declare there's no God, they are perverse. In fact, in verse 3 and 4, they eat people as they eat bread. In that, in that can manifest in very, very different interpretations that they consume, they overtake, they take advantage, they decimate in such a way that they actually destroy, like you would just eat a piece of bread. It's nothing to you. And in that, God restored Zion by the professions of faith. God will deliver Israel. God will restore the fortune of people. And God will guide you in the face of that tragedies. Psalm 14 comes to us to remind us that God is involved in that evil, in that presence. And how is that, how is that God how is he involved? God is, was there to overcome evil. Dr. King preached a sermon on eulogy of the four girls who were killed. And, and one line in his sermon talks about that God is at work at all times to overcome the evil deeds of humanity. God is at work. God has not been absent. In our faith professions, we believe that God is turning the world around despite the choices, wrongful, dreadful, deadly choices of humanity so that they can continue to redeem humanity by the blood of Christ. So Elie Wiesel, one of the survivors of the Holocaust and the author of the famous book, Night, told many, many stories in that book. It's a very small book. How do you recommend you to read it? If you're thinking about why, why is there evil in the world and why is, where was God in these tragedies? He writes in the book, Then came the march that passed the victims. Just in a setting where three people were hung. And this is actually the cover, the original cover of the book. Three people were hung in a concentration camp as an example. The two men were no longer alive, he writes. He wrote, their tongue were hanging out, swollen and bluish. But the third robe was still moving. It was a child, too light to, for the rope to pull on him, and was still breathing, he wrote. So he remained more for more than half an hour, lingering between life and death, and withering before all of our eyes. The entire camp were forced to gather around that entire process, to watch these three people killed by the soldiers. And we were forced to look at him at close range. He was still alive when I passed him. His tongue was still red. His eye has not extinguished. Behind me I heard the same man asking, For God's sake, where is God? And for within me I heard a voice answer, Where he is? There he is, lingering, hanging from the gallow. Elie Wiesel and the psalmist wants to declare to us, God is in his presence at all times, even on un unimaginable cruelty. 
in the face of enemy that we can't see what we do face, God was there in that child's life. From the, to the moment he finally passed. Psalms 14, the fool declare there is no God. The wise are the ones who seek after God. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14, 21, for today's passage, it's a prayer for strength, a prayer for wisdom, a prayer for insight. It tells us that life isn't going, going to be smooth, it's going to be small, uh, quite a nice sailing with no trouble whatsoever. If, if that's the case, then what kind of life will we have? Just our leisures, that we do nothing but just for good things for ourselves? Adversity, as I shared in another sermon, presents an opportunity for us to grow our faith. If there isn't struggle, our faith doesn't have a chance to grow. But because there's faith, because there's adversity within the faith that we have, we can, have, we can grow and deepen our perspective in the way we see things. For the athlete's life, adversity points as a goal for you to achieve. If you are pushing the thresholds of your muscles, of your spiritual, of your mental, physical ability, you cannot reach new goals. So in this week, and the next week as well, the Olympians that's, that's now competing in, in London, they have all reached for the goals for reaching that goal. One of the questions, and I, you, know, you know me, I'm a runner, so I love to read stuff about runners. There's a question asking why the Kenyan runners are the best runner in the world. With Americans and British and all the European nations that have the best technologies, the best nutrition, the best running plan, the best coach in the world, with all the money thrown at the sport, how come only the Kenyans winning all the long races? These skinny, five foot four Kenyans against our six feet tall, 200 pound American runners. Why can they go to compete? Not even close. The article will talk about Kenyan's training facility is basically the foothills of the mountains they run. They run up and down that, foot, that mountain that descends, that starts at 8,000 feet and will descend six miles. So all day long, they run up and down mountains on dirt road with shoes that's given to them by American companies. That's all they do. But the desire to win for the pride of nations and the chance to get out of poverty in Kenya was the very fuel that drives them. See, adversity for them was poverty that forces them to push beyond barriers they, they cannot imagine. We, as North Americans, are too rich, too fat, too slow. We're too comfortable. So faith comes at a time when there are challenges that force us out of our comfort zones and for us to think hard what faith means. Ephesians 3 comes as a prayer to ask God for that strength in face of adversity and ask God for wisdom to know how to navigate through difficult times and ask God's presence that we be grounded and rooted in love not in self-promotional ideas, not in some self-help ideas, not in some things that other people tell us, but grounded and rooted in the love of Christ. And from that, we know how to face adversity. I don't know if you guys know this. Um, for every, pretty much all the babies that have been baptized since we have joined the New Hope family two years ago. It's been two years since we've been here. I guess you're having a good time when... You must have a good time when the time, time just flies by, right? I don't know if you believe, two years have passed since we drove across the country, past Yellowstone, to Idaho, Montana, Dakotas, that just never ends. The Montanas was like, wow, big country. Literally, it was big country. And the babies that since we've been here, have, those have been baptized, all receive a baptism book. You've seen that before. It's a little book, white book. And the goal of that purpose was just to help the children remember their baptism when they grow up. Because in baptism, God claims us. God seals us in God's love. God puts that stamp of approval on all of us and claims us as one of God's own in baptism. That book was act as a way to help them remember their baptism, even though they have no idea when they're baptized. In the baptism book, 
parent can write all these cute things. It's like, just like baby books. For parents among us, you all have baby books. So you know what I'm talking about. That very first footprint. That very first handprint. That very first smudge. That, hope you didn't keep the very first diaper. That would be really gross. All right. So the baptism book has all these different places. A parent can write cute saying, oh, you were so cute when the pastor sprinkled on you and you didn't cry. Well, you smile this way. Well, you, you just you cry so loud, the whole church will cover their ears. Whatever it may be. Godparents can write stuff. Family member can write stuff. But also, I get the privilege and honor to write something in there. The parents may know this, but most of you may not know this. This is a prayer I put in in the baptism book. This is the prayer I ask for the child who is being baptized to receive when they're being sprinkled on the grace of God's water. This is the prayer that I ask on their behalf that when Paul prayed this prayer for the Ephesian church as a new fledgling church growing, that the riches of God's glory would be known to the Ephesians. So your child who is baptized, the riches of God's glory would be known to him or to her, that their inner beings will be strengthened by God's very own spirit, that the power of Christ will be experienced in his or her life, that you will dwell, that you will live in, that you will abide in the presence of God and grounded and rooted in love, that you will have the power to comprehend all things. This is a prayer that I put in all baptism book for all the children who are baptized in our church because life that we know face adversities but we also proclaim Emmanuel, God is with us in all things. As a final thought, I'd like to share with you the final part of Dr. King's sermon uh, in the eulogy for the four girls who were killed. He preached that sermon and he said, I hope you can find some consolation for Christianity's affirmation that death is not the end. Death is not a period that ends a great sentence of life but a comma that punctuates to more lofty significance. Death is not blind alley that leads the human race into a state of nothingness, but an open door which leads man and woman into a life eternal. Let this daring faith that this great invincible sunrise be your sustaining power through the trying days, He's talking to the people who have faced racism, hoses, fire hoses that hold them down, dogs that were sent after them to chew and bite on them because they were in protest, silent protest for injustice. And Dr. King, Dr. King continued by saying, Now I say this to you in conclusion. Life is hard. At times as hard as crucible steel. It has its bleak and difficult moments. Like the ever-flowing waters of the river, life has, has its moments of drought and its moments of flood. Like the ever-changing cycle of seasons, life has the soothing warmth of the summer and the piercing chills of its winters. And if one will hold on, he will deliver and he will discover that God walks with him and that God is able to lift you from fatigue of despair and to the buoyancy of hope, and transform dark and desolate valleys into sunlit inner peace. That's my prayer to you and for you, that whatever challenges that we may face, what you are facing, what you know people are facing, what question you may have about faith, keep asking that question. Keep pursuing that wisdom. Psalm 14 the wise seek after God. Ephesians 3, the prayer is, I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being, that with the power of his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you're being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the heights, and depth to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you will be filled 
with the fullness of God. May the presence of God be with you always. From you take your very first breath to your very last breath and beyond. The Emmanuel God, God with us, walk with us every step of the way. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we are grateful and thankful that we are called upon you as our Emmanuel God, who is indeed present and with us, especially in the moments that we do not know and the moments of despair and moments of sadness and moments of brokenness. In those moments, especially when we need you the most, even when we do not profess and even to the point of rejections, we are grateful that you have been there for us. You were there when we took our very first breath, and you will be there through our entire life when we take our very last breath. And we give you thanks for our ever-present God. But lead us, O oh God, not to a life that's full of comforts and selfish desire, but shape our lives and motivate us to bring transformations in our inner beings so that we can trans- bring transformations of love and joy to the world so full of brokenness. We ask, O oh God, that you give us that power and that faithfulness and that commitment that we will be your instrument for that very purpose and be with our church and our community. Let this be a refuge and sanctuary always and a charging station for those saints who desire to seek after you and to be renewed and to go out once more. Watch over us, O oh God, and we thank you for your saving grace. And this we pray in our Lord's precious name. Amen.